Hello, welcome. My name is Dr. Phil Winder and I'm the CEO of Winder.ai. As you probably know, we operate in the space of machine learning, reinforcement learning and MLOps. And in this series of videos, we like to talk more about the work that we do and hopefully draw some lessons and learnings from that work to pass on to you. Before I start, I've got a little bit of admin. Um, if you would like to ask any questions about this particular presentation live, then please use the chat functionality inside uh, the platform that you're watching the video in. So LinkedIn comments or, or YouTube comments, they should eventually get through to me. Um, and obviously, if you'd like to talk more about any of the, the, the content here or indeed uh, any other ML or MLOps topics, then please do reach out to us um, at winder.ai. In this, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about reinforcement learning. And specifically, uh, I like to focus on applications because applications are cool and they give you some good examples of uh, how reinforcement learning can be used in industry today. I'm going to focus on cybersecurity today. And the reason for that is that we've just completed a project with a, a, a large multi multinational company to help them automate some of the cybersecurity um, uh, tests that they perform inside their organization. And we used reinforcement learning as the, the solution to that problem. But before I dig into that, I'm going to bring up a few slides and I'm going to talk a little bit more now about um, what reinforcement learning is, because I appreciate that it might be new to some of you. Apologies if you're, if you're already an expert in reinforcement learning, uh, but it is worth catching everybody up just so that we're all on the same page. So what is reinforcement learning? Um, when we, you think about the way in which we as humans learn, there's generally two forms. One way of learning is, is via teaching. It's you, you're learning by example. Uh, somebody sits and, and like, like I am today and, and teaches you about a new topic. And that's great. And that works for some um, types of, of, of things that you, you might learn. And, uh, you know, the education system is, is proof of that. Um, another way of learning is learning by doing and learning by experimentation. And this is where you actually try something for yourself and you receive feedback on that to learn whether it was good or not. And the best and classic examples of that is, is when you have to learn something that requires muscle memory. Um, so you can't teach someone how to ride a bike. You can't teach someone, you can't tell someone how to swim. You actually need to get in there and actually try and do it yourself. And through a combination of hurting yourself, falling off the bike and you know nearly drowning in the pool, eventually you learn how to swim and ride a bike. Another example that I like to use is um, this video of a, a chicken. In this example, researchers are placing a pink dot on the table for a chicken to peck at. Every time the chicken touches the pink dot, it's uh, it, it is given a, a reward. Um, you see just then it try it almost touched the blue dot, but it didn't and it didn't get a reward. Um, and whenever it touches the pink dot, it does get a reward. Over time, the chicken is learning a quite a sophisticated strategy of, um, uh, you know, looking at the table, learning where the pink dot is and, and, and tapping it. And <laughs> it just moved then. I thought that was very cruel. There you go. You, you see the, the 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 level of behavior that that was instilled inside this chicken um, purely by uh, a reward mechanism, and that's exactly what reinforcement learning is um, in a in a in a digital sense. This is what we need in order to call it a reinforcement learning problem. All of reinforcement learning is based on this premise that the problem can be described described as a Markov decision process, an MDP. And that's what this picture represents. This is an MDP, a representation of the MDP. So in the previous example there, the agent in this case is the chicken. And the chicken is responsible to choose some action, this A on the right hand side. Um, the action could be, you know, move to the left, move to the right, peck, you know, simple actions like that. Obviously, there's a, they're a bit more nuanced in, a, in, a, in an actual animal. The action is then passed to the environment. And the environment in this case is everything that's external to the agent. So in that previous example, the environment is the table, it's the dots on the table, it's the positions of those researchers, it's the lighting, it's the, the temperature, it's everything, everything inside that environment. That environment then is responsible to 
uh, is responsible for in, for 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 uh, implementing this interface of producing a state representation and a reward. So let's talk about the state for a second. So the state is supposed to be a full representation of the environment so that the agent can use all of that knowledge to base its, its decisions upon. But unfortunately, in most real life situations, you can't have a full representation of the state. You know, in, in, in the chicken, for example, we'd need to know the position of, of, ev of every atom in the universe in order to accurately predict what was going to happen next, for example. So instead, we often work with representations or observations of the state. So in the chicken case, the, the chicken can see, you know, so that's one uh, observation, that's one representation of the state. Chicken can hear, um, the chicken can feel. Uh, all of these things are all being fed to the chicken. Finally, there's the reward. And this is the feedback mechanism. This is the thing that tells the chicken whether um, the previous action or the previous series of actions were good or bad. And that reward can be positive or it can be negative. And positive rewards, but just by, uh, uh, um, just, just by rule, I mean, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be this way around, but positive rewards are denoted to be good. And the actions that led to, to those positive rewards are reinforced and negative rewards are deemed to be bad. And actions that led to the negative reward are, um, are, are, are suppressed. And so you keep going around this loop and eventually the agent, the chicken, learns a series of behaviors or a series of, or a strategy or a technical term is a policy um, that produces a series of actions that maximizes that reward. And yeah, as you saw in the previous case, it works really well in, in, in real life. It works well in humans, it works well in animals, and it works quite well in, um, in, in software as well. Why is this useful? I'll, I'll, I'll go quite quickly over this because I've talked about this before, but it's useful to business because a business is usually made up of three parts. There are processes within the business, there's decisions to be made within the business, and there's strategies to devise in the business. Each of those three layers of a business are defined on the right-hand side by the automating technology. And the, the goal of, of any business at the moment is to try and automate away as much of the, the, the mundane work as possible. And we do that via software engineering to automate the processes. We use machine learning to automate the decisions. I'll explain why in just a second. And uh, we use reinforcement learning to automate the strategies. The key, and the, the, yeah, the key here is that the, the value of each of those business functions is quite different. The, the value of automating a process, for example, connecting to your printer, it has some value, obviously, but it's not great. The value of making a decision is quite large. Potentially, it's acquiring a new client or it's a, you know, making a sale. The value of a strategy, though, that defines the entire business and therefore it is quite high value. And, and obviously, I, I'm not strictly talking about strategy in the sort of business sense. We, we more typically use the word strategy as, as, a, as a way of defining a, um, uh, something that an agent can learn to achieve a set goal. You know, it's not necessarily a business strategy, but it's, it's, a, it's a strategy nonetheless. Um, the one of the main differences between reinforcement learning and machine learning is this loop. So in machine learning, you typically make a single shot decision. You make one decision at one point in time based upon one view of the data. And that's how all machine learning is treated today. And that's okay, that's, that's great for, for situations where you only need to make that one decision. But unfortunately, there's many situations in life which require sequential decision-making. They require multiple decisions over a longer period of time, and you need to optimize against that ultimate goal, not necessarily the next particular state. Okay, And that's where reinforcement learning comes in. You've got this loop, you can learn strategies over time, you can optimize for the long-term gain. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit more about um, the project that we, here we go, the, the project that we, we've been working on for this multinational. Um, so let me set some, some context first. Inside an organization, there are applications deployed. 
those applications are potentially sensitive. They have information within, uh, within them that the organization probably doesn't want to expose to normal users or, or indeed attackers. Um, there's a number of different ways in which an attacker could, could perform an attack in order to get access to that data or to those systems. But one common way is through an exploit called SQL injection. And this is where a website or an application has some data that is backed by a database, or at least a database that is backed by um, uh, something that is, uh, uh, that, that is connected to via an SQL interface. And sometimes what you can do is that you can use the APIs of the website you know, it could be an actual API, like a REST API, or it could be something on a web page, for example. And you can paste certain queries inside uh, those APIs in order to try and get access to the data. And if the application developer is not careful, it can be quite easy to execute arbitrary SQL queries via a website. One, um, way of mitigating against that happening is by introducing something called a web application firewall. So a normal firewall just blocks communication on a TCP IP level, but a web application firewall um, blocks communication on uh, an application layer, on an application level. And so in this case, most WAFs attempt to block SQL injection uh, attacks by basically pattern matching. They look at the query that's requested, they see if it's dangerous, if it's dangerous, then they block it. The problem is, is that, like I said, most of these WAFs are rule-based, or at least they have a, uh, a fairly static algorithm to decide whether the SQL injection is dangerous or not. And that poses a problem, because if the rule set isn't complete, then there is a potential opening there for an attacker to exploit. So where does reinforcement learning come in? The cool thing about reinforcement learning is what we can do is we can train an agent to perform that attack. We can train an agent to send SQL queries to a web application firewall and ask the web application firewall to see whether that query uh, was accepted or not. And the idea sounds quite simple, but actually it's a little bit tricky because obviously a, a WAF you, in a WAF, you only want to block the dangerous queries. You don't want to block like legitimate queries that the user is making. So you've got to be a little bit careful. And the way that we tackled that in our approach was we attempted to take um, the uh, take a, a seed query, a query that is known um, to be uh, dangerous, and then attempt to mutate that query in a predefined number of ways in order to get it past, to sneak it past the web application firewall. So we start off with a query, we go into this payload mutator and the agent itself is going to learn which actions to, to take. And the mutations could be like adding white space, adding random characters, adding new lines, adding comments, ideally things that don't actually change the substance of the query. Then the mutated payload goes into the WAF the WAF then reports whether a, uh, a payload has made it through or not. And um, we use that to produce a reward to state that the agent is positively rewarded if the query makes it through the WAF and, um, and zero otherwise. We also need to do a little bit of NLP in order to understand and basically represent the state of the query because, you know, we... we the, the agent needs to be able to see the query in order to know how to mutate it. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of work there to understand what the query actually means and represent that query in some kind of abstract space and then feed it into the agent so that it has the knowledge of um, what that query is trying to do. And this approach was pretty successful. Um, so we tested it on a number of firewalls and obviously some were, were better than others. And uh, so these were these are some of the examples that were generated by this automated agent. Um, we've got two um, things to look at here. We've got an original query, which is at the top, and then a mutated query. So the original is a known um, 
uh, pattern that is used by attackers for various reasons. They're not necessarily like hacks, but they they are things that lead to an attack. So for example, this is just kind of testing to see if you can actually execute arbitrary stuff against an SQL uh, interface. It's not necessarily performing an attack. Whereas, you know, the, the, the example below is actually trying to select um, you know, some stuff from a database and actually expose data. Um, the, the mutated equivalents are basically the, the result after running the seed query through this loop a few times so that it's mutated the, 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 the query. And this was the final query that actually made it past the WAF. So you can see here that it's added some comments, it's added some random characters, it's added some new lines, and that was enough to get it past this particular WAF. Um, similarly, uh, on the the next one, this is a, a bit more complicated, but yeah, lots of new lines, lots of comments, um, again, made it past the WAF, and so on and so on. And bear in mind that these are all valid SQL queries. This is all valid SQL. Um, it's just obfuscated to the point where the, the WAF isn't really um, doing its job anymore. I'm not going to dig into any more details than that. Um, I we, we produced a, a case study. Um, which provides a little bit more information. You can see that uh, at the link um, at the bottom here, and you can just find it by browsing through our, our website and looking at our blog. Um, I'm also not going to comment on uh, the, the the particular WAFs involved, um, but I would just would like to note that this is a, a genuinely useful tool that the multinational is now using in order to help you know, improve their security posture. They're using this to proactively test that their WAFs are secure. So um, obviously, you know, the, the idea here is to be able to use this tool to provide some evidence that your WAF is secure. Um, it, your, your, your security posture is only as good as, um, <laughs> as the next hacker. So uh, if you're able to actually proactively test your security posture, then yeah, that, that, that provides a bit of confidence that you are secure. Obviously, it doesn't guarantee that you are secure uh, where, because nothing can. Okay, I just want to, uh, in, a, in, a, in the remaining sort of five or 10 minutes, I'm just going to cover a couple of other uh, examples as well um, in the cybersecurity space because they may be of, of interest to you. Um, so these are taken from the literature. These are taken from um, publicly uh, published papers. Um, they're not work that we did ourselves, but if you are interested in implementing this in your enterprise or, or company, then, then certainly get in touch. So the first one is penetration testing. So this is a slightly different type of attack where a, an attacker is attempting to uh, gain access to a secure network. Um, in this particular paper and the, the resulting environment that the research has created in order to, to demonstrate this, which you can see the link on the, the left hand side here, um, the idea here is that in this abstracted computer network, the agent is attempting to block an attacker. Where this is actually quite interesting is that the attack is also simulated using reinforcement learning. So this is an example of, of multi-agent reinforcement learning. We've got two agents operating in within the same environment and the attacker is trying to attack, the defender is trying to defend, uh, the attacker can perform certain actions, the defender can perform certain actions and that causes the, the attacker to be either successful or not successful. And you can run this game through to um, you know, learn successful and interesting ways of defending your network. A similar idea is, and yeah, this is quite a related actually, um, a similar idea is to basically uh, attempt to set the task of providing some adversarial learning um, for your agents in order to strengthen them in a real attack. Um, so of course the attacker could actually be uh, a real person or it could be another automated agent. Either way, um, this is a similar idea where uh, 
in a simulated virtualized network. The, the, the difference between this example and the previous example was the previous example was quite highly abstracted. This example um, actually uses a software defined network in order to perform the defense against an attacker. So the beauty about software defined networks is that you can, uh, in real time, you can alter the network layout and the connectivity between servers um, in, yeah, in real time and, and dynamically um, and through code. So it makes it very easy to disconnect certain parts of your infrastructure if you believe an attack is happening. So in this image, you can see some red dots and the red dots represent where the attackers currently are in the uh, you know, notional network. We've got a couple of different subnets and the, um, the blue server represents the critical server that they're trying to avoid the attacker gaining access to. Um, so for example, it could be some important database or something like that. Um, and there's some possible migration destinations, but I think that's, you know, that's kind of a bit excessive um, for, for this sort of naive example. Um, so let's just consider the attacker and the defender. So what they did was they uh, simulated the attacks on the different networks and they trained various algorithms to attempt to disconnect and block the attackers by cutting the connection between them and critical servers. Um, depending on the implementation of the reinforcement learning algorithm, they actually got slightly different results. The, the results were similar in the sense that the network was disconnected between the attacker and the um, you know, the protected nodes, the nodes that we're trying to, to, to avoid there. Um, so in that sense, that demonstrates that reinforcement learning is capable of learning strategies to avoid, um, uh, avoid penetration uh, tests on a network by, by, by disconnecting nodes. Um, but it's also kind of interesting to, to know which nodes were added and which nodes were uh, uh, deleted from the eventual subnet. Um, from the eventual uh, network. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got, <laughs> it's actually attempted to disconnect the links between the, 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 the host and the, where the host currently resides in, in, in uh, uh, yeah, where the, the, the attacker and the host in which the attacker currently resides. Um, on the, the right-hand side, it's left that connected because it kind of knows that it doesn't really make any difference. It's isolated there. Um, We've got another, uh, yeah, we've, there's, a, there's a couple of other differences in, in on the right hand side, this server has been left within the network and on the left hand side, it hasn't, it's been disconnected. So uh, you could say that the algorithm on the left hand side has um, returned a slightly more conservative result than the one on the right hand side. Um, so obviously you would take that into consideration when you're designing your, your algorithm. Um, yeah, if you're interested in learning a bit more about that particular use case, then you can check out the, the, the public paper here. If you are interested in learning more about reinforcement learning in general, then I recommend that you check out my book. Um, it's by O'Reilly, it's published by O'Reilly, I mean, and it's called Reinforcement Learning, Industrial Applications of Intelligent Agents. I wrote this book because I, thought and still think that there is a need to educate industry in the use of reinforcement learning. So I try to tackle more industry specific problems than other reinforcement learning books. I do also cover the, the, the theory as well. So hopefully it, it gets you, uh, um, it helps you get up to scratch with the, the theory behind reinforcement learning. But yeah, it also touches upon the, the d development of, of industrial um, agents and industrial reinforcement learning as well. So definitely check that out if you are interested in learning more. The accompanying website for that book is rlbook.com. Um, so there's a bit more information about the book there. And if you've got any more questions uh, right now, I'm going to take a look at the, the, the chat in just a moment. Otherwise, you can reach out Dr. Phil Winder on LinkedIn and Twitter at phil at winder.ai over email or the website winder.ai. If you have any problems you'd like to discuss that you're working on in your um, in your job and you need some some help to do that, then then definitely reach out to us there. Okay.
Thank you very much. I'm just going to pause now and I'm going to take a look at the chat window just to see uh, whether there's any questions. How is, ah, so we've got one, so that's great. Thank you very much. I'm going to see if I can answer this question. How is there a sequential decision when you get a binary reward in this case? Okay, so I assume that you're I assume that you are referring to the uh, cybersecurity example, the WAF example. Yes, you're right. It is binary in the sense that you know we 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 made it through the WAF or we did not. Um, and uh, the reason why it's sequential is because when you first get that seed query, that seed query does not make it through. Okay, so the reward is zero. The agent then needs to inspect and analyze that SQL query and make a, muta make a mutation. It needs to change that query in order to try and get it through. So it makes a mutation and tries again, it doesn't get through again. So it makes another mutation and another and another and another. And then eventually it does get through. So you get one reward after say 10 mutations or something. Over time, it learns that a particular set of mutations are, 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 are mutating in a particular way is, is is good because it's got that final reward at that point. And it actually, it did tend to, to towards certain strategies like uh, new lines and comments, especially, and adding sort of random comments um, for this particular WAF. So there, there is a kind of a, 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 a fairly standard way of defeating this particular WAF. Um, yeah, but it did that by sequentially and attempting to mutate that query over multiple times. All right, that's a good question. Thanks a lot. Okay, that's it for the the, the questions that I can see now. Uh, I'll, I'll, if there's any more that will come in in the, the next few minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely endeavor to, to answer them offline. Um, but for now, thank you very much. My name's been Phil Winder, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.